people introducing tests for coronavirus, contract tracing, uh, forced isolation or, or quarantine uh, as part of people's itinerary. Um, so there are countries coming up with solutions for how tourism can reopen. Um, of course, the other part of this is getting humans to move around the world. And you're seeing airlines uh, who've struggled uh, to no end in the last three months are starting to beef up their summer schedules. And I think a lot of people still hoping, at least in the UK, we're still hoping we might be able to uh, get a holiday this summer. Um, that said, airports are currently still ghost towns. I'm sure you've seen uh, lots of pictures on the, uh, the news of, uh, of just how few people have been traveling. Uh, and the collapse, of course, of this tourist economy has bankrupted hotels, restaurants, bus tour operators, car rental agencies, uh, you name it. I think the estimates I've seen is over 100 million people globally out of, of work. And so this is very timely to have this discussion around Central Asia because, you know, there are lots of questions abound, abounding around whether foreign travel will just become too expensive to allow for social distancing whether effectively we will go from over-tourism in some parts of the world to no tourism, uh, essentially overnight. And, and, you know, questions about the days of high volume, high speed, low cost human movement uh, simply uh, coming to a halt. Um, you, you know, I, I always uh, like to have a little bit of a joke, but, um, you know, innovation will, uh, will I'm sure, abound here. Um, and I used to hate the idea of destination weddings because it was huge expense where you'd go and see somebody get married far away. Um, uh, but maybe now destination weddings will happen socially distanced with a happy couple on a beach and we only need to be on a Zoom call to, uh, to view them uh, while we stay at the comfort of our armchairs. Some tourist spots uh, um, are trying new things. Uh, I, I saw over the weekend uh, you can now take a tour to meet the wild animals of Chernobyl in Ukraine uh, and for £20 a local resident will take you on a live group tour uh, to cover the history and aftermath of the fateful explosion and you can even meet the animals without actually having to get uh, close to them in fear of, uh, of actually either catching something or getting bitten. So I wonder is this the start of a new virtual reality type of tourism and I, I will be interested to hear thoughts on that later today. Now, Central Asia, of course, um, is not a tourist hotspot in the traditional sense. Um, I think you've seen a lot more tourism grow in the past. But just to give you some context, tourism in Central Asia, um, at least uh, last time this was estimated back in 2017, uh, contributed just 2% of, uh, of the GDP of Central Asia. Um, it was just $4 billion as an industry, which is still a large number. But to give you context, the Caribbean typically has a 40% uh, contribution of tourism to GDP. Greece, 20%, the UK, 10%. Um, but one of the things that was evident to me was that tourism in Central Asia was a growing trend. It was part of a new economy that was going to bring new jobs uh, to, to the region. So it will be, of course, very interesting to hear from the panel and from uh, members of the audience uh, as to really what, uh, that, uh, what future that might hold. Um, and uh, speaking of travelers and tourists, perhaps I should just end this uh, introductory remarks uh, with a little quote by novelist uh, and travel writer Evelyn Waugh that some of you may know. Um, and uh, this fits very well to me, I'm afraid, but uh, um, he said, every Englishman abroad, until it's proved to the contrary, likes to consider himself a traveler and not a tourist. Uh, and I think uh, those, those two ideas are probably something that fits very well with Central Asia. I say it's not a tourist destination, it's certainly a traveler's destination. So without further ado, I'm, I'm delighted to introduce our expert panel. We've kindly agreed to take part in the panel session and, uh, and then answer questions. Um, what we'll do is have about 25, 30 minutes of discussion with the panel. Um, and so if we could have the panel unmuted for that bit, but if everybody else could stay on mute, uh, and then we'll move into a Q&A session where you'll be very welcome to either ask questions to the panel directly or generally. You may have uh, a short statement or comment about something you've heard that you'd like to contribute. Uh, so that will then open up the floor and um, uh, I will ask, uh, is it uh, Sania or Bojenia who's um, managing the, uh, the, the, the Q&A? But uh, you're welcome to either write Q&A into the chat or uh, effectively raise your hand and uh, hopefully you'll catch uh, her eye so she can allow you to comment. So let me just introduce the, uh, the panel. Uh, on the panel we have uh, Jonathan Campion who's a writer, translator and editor based in the UK. 
Uh, since finishing his degree uh, in Russian, he was introduced to Central Asia through a rather enviable role as a market analyst in the wine and spirits industry, traveling to most of Central Asia to meet with alcohol companies. Uh, I suspect that in order to save his liver, he's more recently spent time as a Russian translator, editor and proofreader, while also contributing to the OCA magazine and Lonely Planet guidebooks. So he's intricately connected with what tourists and travelers are looking for in the region. Next is Gareth Stamp. Gareth is originally from Great Britain, but for the past 10 years has taken on the nomadic lifestyle of working in education internationally. He's currently based in India. He's lived in Kazakhstan for uh, nearly nine years, working across a wide range of projects in, for the government, private organizations and NGOs, and set up his own company, uh, creating philanthropic uh, groups. He's uh, been a member of ECG for three years now and is shortly to publish, uh, I'm told finally, his first children's book with uh, Hertfordshire Press, and he's also contributed articles to uh, OCA magazine uh, and post COVID-19 has plans to reignite his travels in Uzbekistan. Thirdly, Rafis Abazov uh, is a visiting professor at Al Farabi Kazakh National University and a director of the Ban Ki-moon Institute for Sustainable Development. He's the author of a number of books, including the formation of post-Soviet international politics in Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan and Uzbekistan, uh, the culture and customs of Central Asian republics and the stories of Great Steppe. Uh, amongst others. His research interests and publications focus on cultural globalization and the intellectual history of Central Eurasia and Russia, as well as public policy, governance, contemporary cultural and intellectual and political trends in the region. And last but not least, Beruz Hamzaev, I hope I pronounced it correctly, is the CEO and founder of World Influences Network and Deputy Director of the Foundation for Development of Science and Education, ZEO Forum. He has been on a mission to attract attention to Uzbekistan, uh, his country, uh, since he worked as a tour guide, traveling to every corner of his homeland. He regularly shares content online to further his aim of encouraging people to, visit, to visit the country and previously worked as strategy advisor to Ministry of Tourism for Uzbekistan, responsible for actually branding the country uh, of Uzbekistan. He recently organized the first World Influencers Congress in Uzbekistan, where over 100 influencers were invited to uh, Uzbekistan. I think you'll agree, ladies and gentlemen, that we do have a very wide and distinguished panel uh, today. Before uh, we start on the discussion, um, what I would just like to invite you to do, um, you may have seen uh, this website called menti.com. It's M-E-N-T-I.com. Uh, what I'm going to do is just invite you to, um, to go to menti.com. We have a very short uh, quiz that I think will be of interest to set up the discussion. So if I could just ask that I can share my screen, I'll give you the code. Um, and those who can access the website uh, can, uh, uh, can, uh, can then uh, look at the questions. Virginia, can you give me uh, the screen sharing right, please? That's lovely. Yes, you can do it now. So if, if anyone can just write, uh, put their hand up and let me know if you can see the, uh, the screen. Yep. So if you type the following code into menti.com, which is 870672 and press submit, that's 870672. If you do that and press submit, hopefully you will actually see some questions. And what I would just appreciate if you could do is answer the questions as, uh, as you see them. And the first question, is when do you think the majority of tourists will return to Central Asia again? Whether it's end of 2020, 2021, later than 2021, or whether tourism may not even return as a result of the pandemic. So if you would select one of those questions, that would be good. I will just select one for argument's sake. It's not the right answer. There's no right answers. Um, I'll give everyone a little moment. Can you see the results, hopefully? So just some food for thought. I think uh, we've got 10 in so far. I'll give people a few more minutes to see whether uh, they can uh, add any more questions, but uh, just some food for thought about uh, how uh, optimistic people are. Okay, now I can't get the thing to work, which is always good.
Right. Okay. Well, I can't seem to get this to work, which is wonderful. <laughs> Apologies. Just bear with me. Let's see if we can get the next one. Can anyone see the uh, next slide? Yeah, you can see the next slide. So if you could just uh, give your views on to what extent you agree, whether you will still travel even if there's a quarantine risk, whether you will travel aboard less, focusing more on domestic travel, uh, whether you think Central Asia should rely less on tourism and focus on other activities, and uh, whether reducing tourism in Central Asia could be a good thing in the long run if they focus GDP efforts elsewhere. And the last one is whether Central Asian governments should forget about tourism and income uh, and focus elsewhere. So I'll just give a few minutes for people to uh, give their thoughts and, and hopefully that will give the panel some view of where the, uh, the audience uh, is coming from. I think we've got five answers so far, so I'll leave it a few more minutes. Just let a few more people answer. There still seem to be uh, a large chunk of people who uh, will travel even if there's a quarantine risk, but also people focusing perhaps more on domestic tourism. So it'll be interesting to see how, uh, how that discussion plays out. And uh, quite a strong view that uh, tourism is still obviously important to the governments and GDP efforts. So thank you very much. That was uh, just to get a sense of where the uh, audience are. I'll, I'll stop sharing now um, and uh, move on if you like to uh, to the actual panel discussion. So Bajene, could you just make sure all the panelists are um, off mute? And what I'll do just to allow them to say it in their own words, I'll just go around the panel. And if I could ask the panel to just briefly add anything further about the introduction, particularly if correct me if I've got anything wrong, um, and then ask you to explain really what your interest and engagement is with tourism in Central Asia prior to the, the current pandemic. So maybe we'll start with uh, Jonathan, uh, please. Well, Nick, you said it perfectly just now that I'm a, a writing translator with a, a focus on Eurasia. So the Caucasus in Central Asia. Um, I've traveled to Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan and Kyrgyzstan many times. Firstly, as an alcohol analyst, which meant that, um, oh, can you see me still? Which meant that I had business meetings as well as sort of seeing the country. And I've since come back as simply just as a, as a writer and photographer. So I think I've seen Central Asia both as a as a, a businessman as, as well as a, a creative soul. Thank you. And, and Gareth, maybe the same question to you, which is just to uh, understand your engagement with tourism, particularly in Central Asia prior to uh, the current mm. pandemic. Similar to Jonathan, I went there originally for business, um, fell in love with the country, and then realised I needed to see more of it. Um, I think um, travelling traveling around as a traveller, as opposed to a tourist, um, gave me a love for the country, certainly Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan as well. Um, but I also got involved in organising events and things and getting people to come into Central Asia. Uh, and one of the issues was actually most people didn't know anything about it. Um, and when they got there, they found it was so vast that you had to organise lots and lots of different ways of, of travelling around there. So my interest was in how you made an efficient uh, tourist destination, certainly out of somewhere like Kazakhstan, um, and, and that's where I that's where I was interested in. And, and I have to say, really, I, I'm not a tourist expert, but I'm very keen on spreading the knowledge of Central Asia because it's a beautiful place. The people are amazing, and it's got right under my skin, and so it's it's part of me now, uh, and so I want to share that with people. Um, and I think you were right. When you said at the start, you were right, it was growing, uh, the tourism in the area. Uh, and it's a shame that the, that the pandemic has happened at this particular time, because I think Kazakhstan in particular was about to turn the corner with some of its tourism. Uh, it was starting to get its act together. And I think that's really been knocked now. And I think they have to rethink now. Yeah, and I'm sure we'll, we'll 
come later to how they might rethink. But thank you, uh, Gareth. Uh, I guess, uh, Rafis, uh, the same question really to you, which is just to understand, um, you know, you have a different perspective uh, being from the region and uh, linked to it very closely and having written about it. So just would be interested to understand a little more about how you're uh, engaged with uh, tourism in Central Asia, as I say, prior to, uh, to this pandemic. We, we can't, still we can't muted. Rafis, I think. He's muted. Okay. Can you yes. hear me now? Perfect. Yeah. Hello, everyone. I hope you can hear me. So let me go to the question. I was engaged in Central Asia and tourism and all relief areas in three ways. One is, as a writer, I wrote uh, a couple of books, and including Culture and Customs of Central Asian Republics and Pelgrave, Historical Dictionary of Central Asia, we, uh, and uh, when I was collecting my uh, materials for my books, I, I traveled a lot, made photos, talked to people, talked to experts. This is one way. Second, I was engaged in Central Asia as a researcher, doing research on different aspects, especially uh, media, multimedia, social media, new social media, uh, all this, like, uh, this angle, uh, the looking at how Central Asia is, uh, uh, how to say, represented in uh, cyberspace. And number three, I was involved as a uh, teacher, as a lecturer, uh, teaching uh, students at universities and capstone and managing capstone projects. And uh, while we manage capstone projects, we actually uh, work on talking and dealing with branding of Central Asian Republics, branding of uh, Central Asian region, and branding of uh, Silk Road. Thank, thank you, Ravis, uh, and indeed, uh, <laughs> lots of qualifications indeed to, uh, to talk about this topic. And maybe lastly, uh, maybe, uh, just a little bit more from yourself around your involvement, particularly interested to hear about the uh, branding of Uzbekistan and uh, the World Influencers Organization as well. Uh, Thank you. Thank you very much, Nick, and uh, good afternoon, everybody, from sunny Tashkent, from Uzbekistan. Uh, yeah, we've been doing quite a remarkable work. Uh, uh, tourism in general were exploding around the world, but especially Uzbekistan was getting one of, like, uh, one of the you know, best, best results, best numbers, because year to year from 2016 to 2019, we had a... Uh, the number of the tourists it was like 1.3 million tourists a year record breaking uh, 6.3 million tourists but it is what it is until work into bringing the presence of Uzbekistan into a digital era we believed in the in the in the internet and we believe that the content is uh, ultimately the the king and we created we started to create a lot of content about it and uh, yeah i would love to share about the perspectives and talk talk to you about the context of Uzbekistan. So thank you very much thank, thank you very much um, maybe uh, just um uh, to, uh, to to maybe continue with, with you, Beruz, because uh, um, I guess you're in Uzbekistan at the moment, and it would be tourist season right now. Um, what what what? How has the current pandemic impacted tourism as you're seeing it uh, today? I mean, is there anyone visiting? Is it completely uh, uh, empty monuments and museums? Uh, unfortunately, yes. Like being a guide for ten, like for more than ten years, like for me, it's very sad to see uh, Rajasthan empty. I never saw that. It's quite surreal. Uh, I never saw Poi Kalon in Bukhara, one of the magnificent cities of the world. It's completely empty, like a ghost town during the day and during the night. So unfortunately, it is. Uh, if we give a little quick information regarding what what was happening here, is that officially Uzbekistan. Uh, brought the uh, quarantine into context from uh, effective immediately from 16th of March, Uzbekistan was closed. Uh, and ever since we're not receiving any, any, any foreign visitors. Uh, 
there were like one, 1,500 travel companies, around 1,200 hotels, they're all closed. 250,000 people were involved in the tourism sphere, they're all laid off. Uh, at the moment, at the moment, uh, I, I see a glimpse of hope because Uzbekistan is uh, opening up its borders to certain countries, like a green zone countries, namely Japan, Korea, China, and Israel. And uh, I spoke to the friends from Uzbekistan Airlines, and they want to reinitiate the flights with a, uh, in a lucrative uh, market, such as Tashkent, Moscow, Tashkent, Istanbul. At the Moscow, I would doubt, because as you know, in Russia, the, the spike is high. However, uh, the president was really eager to bring the tourism back on life, and he was like uh, constantly, uh, constantly making uh, his way and doing a lot of actions toward the fact that we need to open it up. But the first movement in Uzbekistan, I think, is going to be focused on a domestic tourism. Uh, still, we have 35 million people, and clearly, they are at home. We cannot travel elsewhere. And domestic traveling was kind of inheritably um, uh, a culture. We call them ziorat tourism or pilgrimage tourism, because as you know, Uzbekistan has several like holy cities and local people tend to travel. So to the extension of my understanding and knowledge is that the domestic tourism is going to restart, to initiate. As a matter of fact, I think at 10 days ago, Uzbekistan railways have started its uh, routes, Tashkent Bukhara, Tashkent Samarkand, and people, despite the fact that you have to go certain uh, procedure, people are traveling. So that was the first thing. And uh, after that, I think to the, till, till September, we're going to reinitiate the flights depending, again, the, the conditions on the uh, COVID-friendly countries, the green countries, like uh, Turkey, maybe it's uh, Southeast Asia. Uh, like we, we gotta see, we gotta see. It's too early to say something. And as you know, the pictures are changing dramatically. Now uh, that's, that's, that's obviously good to hear, but clearly a, a big uh, devastating toll. Uh, Rafis, I, I, I've lost your image of you, but or your video of you, but uh, I'm hoping you can still hear us because I'd be interested to see, again, from someone looking from inside, whether uh, you, you resonate with um, what Beruz has said just now. I'm not sure if you can hear us. We've lost your video. Rafis, can you hear us? Uh, yeah. <clears throat> Hello. Now I got you. Yeah. I just wondered if, if what Beruz was saying about uh, what's happening in Central Asia, and particularly in Uzbekistan, resonated with how you see it from inside the country, as it were. Uh, you know, yes. Right now, we could see that, for example, if I uh, look at uh, what's happening in Kazakhstan, uh, international flights uh, practically went all the way to, I don't say to zero, but uh, probably 95% of flights were uh, suspended. And only this week and actually next week, they will start opening. And probably they will open about, uh, I will calculate, say, initially for first month as a trial, as a pilot, they will open about 20% of flights. And then if they, they actually, according to like official government reports, actually reports from different uh, uh, semi-governmental agencies, so they will have first stage of trial, everything will, will go well. So in one month, they will open maybe another 10% of flights. So target is until September to open at least uh, between 30 to 50% of flights. Uh, domestic uh, travels are already, uh, the situation is, here is different and difficult and complicated. Uh, at one point, they open uh, domestic travels trains, uh, car travels, everything else. And then there were a couple of spikes in uh, coronavirus uh, infections in some areas. Then they start introducing uh, blocks and they introduce, start introducing restrictions. Then they lift again, uh, reduce the restrictions. And then uh, recently they start reintroducing some restrictions around Nur Sultan city, around Almaty city, and around Karaganda city. And they consider there might, might be some restrictions around Chimken and uh, Atrao. So basically, uh, picture is mixed. So uh, on the one hand, uh, like small baby steps to open international trips, international travels, easing restrictions on international visitors. On the other hand, 
they thought they would be able to lift uh, domestic restrictions. Unfortunately, it didn't happen because they still have like pockets of coronavirus infections. Therefore, it's limited. So we hope the tourism will start recovering, but nobody actually in his uh, or her mind will give like precise dates and precise figures. Yeah, and, and, and of course, it's very, very uncertain. Maybe going to the other side, to the international visitors then. Um, Gareth, I mean, you know, you want to go back to Uzbekistan, I think, as COVID is, is over. Um, when will you go back? What will you need to, to, to get you to go back? I think, again, Gareth is on mute. If we could just unmute him. Okay. Um, at the moment, I've got a, a new job, which should start on August the 10th. Um, where I've been in negotiations all day as to how that can happen. Um, my biggest problem has actually not been about getting into Uzbekistan because I believe I can actually go to Uzbekistan as long as I do 14 days quarantine. My biggest problem has actually been getting out of India um, because it's only literally um, now that we're actually getting any international flights out of here and they're rescue flights to take people out of India. Um, domestic uh, flights started here last week and I've flown two domestic flights and have to say it's the most horrible experience I've ever had in my life. So I think get pe getting people back used to flying uh, is going to be a real struggle. Um, the protection gear we had to wear, the face masks, everything, um, it actually made for a really, really stressful um, trip or two trips in my case. Um, it was trips I couldn't avoid and um, everybody was very nervous about it and, and rightly so. The airlines, they're doing their best, but they really are struggling to try and put in place safety for their own staff and their customers. So I think that's going to be a major issue. Um, I, I've got no, uh, having flown twice now uh, since the, the, the pandemic, um, I now feel more confident about it. The airports seem to have got their act together, but the airlines don't seem to have. Um, I'm getting lots of different messages from different airlines, different rules. So if you're changing airlines, the rules change. I don't know how that balances up. But in terms of getting back into Central Asia, I think once it does open, people will go there because I think they're looking for something different. If you imagine, uh, I've been in, in uh, isolation here for nearly 90 days now um, in my house. Um, I've been allowed out a little bit, but not much. What I want now is some space. I want to get out there and I want to walk across the step. I want to actually see some space and actually see the sky and get some fresh air. But, I mean, at the moment, we don't know what the actual um, time scale is going to be, as you said. I need to be in Uzbek Uzbekistan, hopefully 10th of August. We shall see. Um, it may be September. So, so I mean, yeah, that's, uh, your description of the travel uh, <laughs> fills me with a little bit of dread. Jonathan, I mean, uh, are you hopping on a plane uh, anytime soon? Back to Central Asia, if, if nowhere else. Um, I feel very similar to Gareth in as much as it's not the actual countries that sort of scare me. It's the, the transport aspect of it. So as soon as airlines kind of get their act together and, and work out how to social distance as soon as it becomes okay to you know take taxis to the airport and taxis from the airport and metro systems and, and things like that I think that's the issue for me um, and I think actually the issue of social distancing plays into Central Asia's hands because there's so many places that you can go into the steppe into the wilderness yeah and there's no one there so there's no one there exactly that and I think that in the you know, future, yeah, I, I, think, I think that's a great selling point. I, I mean, sorry to, to interject no. there, but I, I remember uh, about five or six years ago going on a, a, a trek uh, into a nature reserve down near um, Shimkent. Uh, and it's a nature reserve that's the size of England, and they only allow 10 people a day into that nature reserve. Mm. Well, can you imagine the space the size of England with 10 people in it? That is what draws me to, it's not because I'm a boring person who wants to be on my own, but I just do want that space. And that's the place to get it. Um, yeah. And I think that's something which they really can um, target as, a, as a, a way of selling it. Because uh, I think people have been cooped up so much. Yeah, I, I'd like to build on that because, um, I mean, I say it tongue in cheek, but you know, Central Asia's historical links to nomadism <laughs> and being out on the steps. Um, I guess it'd be interesting to hear from the panel um, what sort of suitable and socially distant strategies 
each country might be able to put in place to start the recovery of tourism. And uh, I guess no better person than Beruz to, uh, to perhaps start answering this because you branded Uzbekistan as a certain type of destination for tourists. But how do you think that branding should or will change to enable tourists to feel safe to come once they've got over the horrible airplane experience that we were hearing? Um, and, and once they're there, enjoy the socially distanced sort of uh, nomadism and, and, and sights and scenery. Well, I think I couldn't agree with my friends Jonathan and Gareth here, like, because the country is too big and still the number I was talking about, like 8 million or like 6 million tourists a year is like a very small amount if you just spread it to the, all the sites. And in, I, I can tell you in the context of Uzbekistan that uh, Uzbek, uh, like foreigners travel to Uzbekistan for, for the classic Silk Road experience for seven to 11 days, Tashkent, Samarkand, Bukhara, and Kiva, an occasional mix and match of Termas and Chakhisal. But as a matter of fact, it's just uh, only four of five regions of the country, and there are 14. For instance, Karakal, Pakistan is one of the very rare places that like, not many tourists go, but th that's one of the most like, fantastic places for me as a person who likes the art and who, was, like, who grew up in a museum. They have the Museum of Savitsky. Uh, I think it's by Britannica or by many other uh, like respectable uh, journal media. It was prized that it's among 100 museums you have to see before you die. It's magnificent collection of Russian and Uzbek vanguard. It's in the middle of nowhere. And that's exactly what makes it even more unique. You just never expect to have a world-class museum in the middle of nowhere. But at the same time, telling the middle of nowhere has a negative context. What I'm trying to say here is that uh, Karakal Pakistan in one hand, it's absolutely it's something you never expect. It's like a very platy, it's very beautiful. We have even like pink flamingo for crying out loud they have they, <laughs> a lake nearby very few people know about that we have unfortunate one of the more one of the maybe the saddest uh, man-made catastrophes in the history it's like a aral sea catastrophe like even me being uzbek guy i was learning about it when i was in a school but i never comprehended the amount of how the impact of the human being can be on the planet and on, on the environment. And when I went there, like two years ago with the American bloggers, Vaga Brothers, we went till the Aral Sea in the 8th of December. It was cold, minus 14. You can see the impact of human being. It's just, you know, unimaginable. However, at the same time, it leaves you very like iconic, like almost Martian landscape, very beautiful. On the contrary, Uzbekistan has more than 12, national parks and up to now the irony is that those national parks were closed you know they like were, they were prohibited to go and one of them one of them is one like one of the like rarest one of like i think the best in the world is uh, uh the with the with the i think the dinosaurs dinosaurs uh, the what do you call it, the remainings from like jurassic park at the same time we have one of the caves called the Dark Star in Surkhandaria region. Dark Star is like, imagine Everest, the longest uh, caves in the world. So they were all able to only explore only three kilometers of it. It's just massively crazy that we have so many such places and we were not selling them. We were selling the classic Silk Road experience because, well, you know, that's what, what they were, people were buying. You know, you don't sell, you don't sell, you know, hot dog in a plof place, you sell plof. So there was like added value. So I've lost you on, on a little bit on the screen. I think others might have done. I think the internet may be going, but what I take away from, from what you were saying, and forgive me for interrupting, but I think it has frozen, um, is that there's lots of places to see. Now, here's my challenge to, to members of the panel, and, and Rafis, I might come to you, which is part of what makes it fun traveling to Central Asia is being able to go on a public bus uh, or go into a busy market, interact with the people. Do we not run the risk that this just becomes a sightseeing exhibition of tourists in very sanitized vehicles just traveling around the country and, um, and not really being able to interact with the people? You know, uh, I believe this is a disaster for tourism, but at the same time, it's an opportunity uh, for recalibrating the way how we 
manage tourism and Central Asia will offer a very good opportunity and good sport to, to try different way of uh, having touristic experience. In the past, it was very simple, straightforward, very clean, lean and traditional. Big bars, 20, 30, 40, 50 people traveling to particular sport and under guidance of a local guide or tourist guide from somewhere, listening and uh, looking at what's happening around. Now, this opportunity, and unfortunately, unfortunately, we have to do it. Uh, we can do it in a smaller car, for example, because uh, economic, uh, how to say, I mean, incomes goes down, unemployment is very high, and uh, a lot of car, modern cars are available, a lot of cheap, inexpensive drivers, but with good experience are available. So families, a group of friends, small group of friends, can hire a car, or maybe they can split into two or three cars, according to social distancing, whatever rules they would like to take, and travel together in a kind of a caravan, not in a big bus where, unfortunately, today it's a high risk of getting infection, but in small vehicle, and, you know, it's possible to do it, and uh, uh, it's, it's not very expensive. Uh, it's uh, doable. Now it's a good opportunity. And the uh, distances. Uh, in Kazakhstan, all people love, like, uh, comparing. Kazakhstan is actually size of uh, five times bigger than France. You can take one France, uh, three uh, like five territories of France, five territories of England, and you'll still have space for uh, Italy, Spain, and uh, for example, who else? Greece combined. <laughs> so uh, the problem is this uh, social distancing or big distancing is not a problem at all. Yeah. So I think this is a way how uh, tourism uh, travel agencies, uh, companies, and tourism in Central Asia can in reintroduce itself, saying we can give you Silk Road experience in a Silk Road way. You will be maybe on a work camel, a real camel, or maybe a car, which is you, you, your imagination of a camel, and travel in a very small group, still being able to see and still being able to uh, observe uh, whatever sanitary or uh, social distancing norms you would like to observe. I, but I, I, I guess... And um, to promote just, it properly. Just, just to move, move on, but take that, that point. Um, you know, one of the things, and, and I guess Jonathan and Gareth may, may sympathize with me here, which is we talk about the Silk Road and talk about it eloquently, but the Silk Road covers multiple countries. Now, um, you know, how easy will it be to just go from one country to the next, given every country is going to have different strategies with uh, whether it will let people in, how long it will be quarantine, whether there will be testing. Um, I, I guess, Jonathan, maybe just to come back to you and just say, you know, are the days of short trips and multiple country visits pretty much over because, you know, you're going to risk quarantine, you're going to risk testing, it's going to be a whole hassle to, uh, to go from one border to the next. Yeah, I think it's early to say that, you know, to, to rule a post-mortem on this, but I think that it does look like in the future it will, will be more difficult to travel between countries. So maybe the days of trips, you know, combining Kazakhstan and Kyrgyzstan or Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan might be coming to an end, which means that tourists or travellers might need to focus on one country and maybe see more of that country. So, yeah, yeah that's I, I think that's, I think that's right. I, I mean, I think in the short term, certainly going between countries is going to be a no-no. But I think one of the things that Central Asia could do is to set up a, a, a collective, if you like, uh, between the countries, a tourism collective. Um, I, I think Kazakhstan, for example, is concentrated too much on tourists going to Astana as was, Nuzultan now, uh, because that's where they wanted people to go. Um, but once you're, in, once you're in that place, there's not a lot to see because most of the, the exciting bits of Kazakhstan are in the south. It may be that in a slightly longer term, maybe 10 years, they actually set up a, a tourism hub that isn't um, the capital, uh, somewhere like Kizilorda, for example, because very soon Baikonur is going to become uh, redundant uh, and given back to Kazakhstan. And um, I think there's a perfect tourist opportunity there to actually create something really major as a tourist attraction. And Kizilorda is very close to the borders of of a lot of the other areas there where you can see lots of tourism, it is doable from that place. It's not doable in the same way from even Almaty or, uh, or, or Astana as was 
But somewhere like that, if you set up a new tourist hub, I think that would be a good investment um, because it is close to the to Uzbekistan, it's close to Kyrgyzstan. Um, but, but Scott, I, I, that's, that's really an idea. Really interesting idea, and, and I guess you're going into the opportunities that this can actually present. Yeah. Maybe, maybe can I just ask, because I see that uh, Beruz is back, I'd be keen to understand how Uzbekistan, someone who's worked for, for the Ministry of Tourism in Uzbekistan, sees that idea. I know it's in a different country, and I'm sure Uzbekistan would want it to be in Uzbekistan, but um, you know, how, how do you see this idea of a new travel hub or a travel region, as Gareth was uh, proposing? Uh, well, I think that's a really marvelous idea. And I understand that the COVID is kind of uh, like canceling on this idea or putting this idea on a delay. But uh, when we were in the ministry, we pushed the idea of Central Asian integration so ahead. We wanted to have a Silk Road visa. We, like, we wanted to initiate, we always supported this idea. Because to be honest, even when I was in a, in a ministry, like uh, I, I fight, I fought very hard on a, just the concept and a notion of idea of having a visa to come to a country. I do understand uh, the consequences. I understand why we have it, but we, we fought it. And I think it was quite successful because we, at the moment, if you take Uzbekistan uh, on occasion, we have 88 countries visa free. Like the majority of the old world can travel to Uzbekistan like, like easy. And the other majority can receive a visa without leaving their couches for just $20. And we were like even just trying to abolish this, having that visa upon arrival. And at the same time, the, the, the best, the conversation, the farthest I think we, we went was with Kazakhstan to initiate the Silk Road visa. So I think that integration has to be in it. However, COVID-19 is changing because, uh, well, different countries, different situation, even in the same country has its own regions. We have certain regions, they're red, they're yellow, they're green, and uh, it, it's, a, it's just a more complication. So I think new touristic destinations and nomadic, nomadic experience, the, like why people come to Uzbekistan and Central Asia? The, People want to experience something that they never experienced. Like we, when you go to Thailand, when you go to Egypt, you know you're going to go, you want to have that crowdedness around you, the chaotic night, <laughs> nightlife that people are just next to. You want it. It's a part of the deal. When you come to Central Asia, this is not the part of the deal. The, one of the main reasons you want to come is that it's not it's not discovered yet. And guess yeah. what? There will be certain cities, you will be the only foreigner. And for a lot of people, for a lot of people, it's one of the added values. And uh, I think we have to play on this. We have to play on it and we have to make more of an interactive. I see this as an opportunity. What, what I'm trying to say is that I see it as an opportunity even to attract the tourists to our traditional cities, to, to, to traditional routes, but at the same time, I think uh, for luxury travel companies, if they are here, any travel companies here, the next wave of the people who are going to travel, those people are going to be quite rich people or the people who can afford traveling, isn't it? So that's why they have to shift their, their focus on the showing them and bespoking them a travel itinerary that is longer. So it's not just the 11 days Uzbekistan, make it 20 days Uzbekistan, but cover everything. So yeah. anyways, when I go to, if I'm European, I'm going to Central Asia. Two years ago, my mind was, I have to go to Uzbekistan and I have to go to uh, uh, Kazakhstan and Turkmenistan for what? For check, check, check. I've been to the region. I never will go probably. And you know what? Might as well. But right now, the idea is different. They will be like, if I'm going, they have, it's, it's, like, it's like a psychological barrier, right? Like, I'm going to, like, I want to be safe, but at the same time, I want to travel. So if they break that barrier, they want to make sure that it is safe. So the country, first of all, as a government, has to ensure that safety, A. B is that travel companies has to offer something unique saying that, you know what, you're going to be the only person in that boutique hotel. Because guess what? There are 1,200 hotels in Uzbekistan. They are not occupied and they're happy to have any kind of cash turnover so they can at least retain people who are working for them. So what I'm trying to say is that pivot, change the business model, change the, the ideology, Inheritively, we are nomads. Everybody in the world, we are nomads. You cannot hold us back. And after two, three months, 
just traveling to your bathroom and and your and your you know the the kitchen you want to just run somewhere yeah, so I, think, is, I, I think i now know why you were chosen to brand uzbekistan that is a very passionate <laughs> and positive but, um, i love my country sorry sorry <laughs> just, no no it's fantastic to hear and, i can't and, wait and to build, go <laughs> it builds on on gareth's idea i, I yeah. guess i mean please i, I want to buy you a plug gareth like whenever okay. you're in tashkent let me you're, know you're on the best place I, for I'm, I'm right, conscious that's, that's of your time and, and, and the, the audience have watched patiently and I think this might be a good juncture uh, to just allow for some questions, challenges, comments uh, from the audience. Um, I see there are some questions on the chat. So, um, Virginia, maybe you can choose how you would like to uh, ask questions or whether you want people to ask, make comments. Um, and uh, we, we as the panel will try and then um, answer them and if people have questions for a specific panel member please feel free to ask that panel member but other panel members please jump in i think rafis has had to leave us but there's still uh, the three plus me uh, around so uh, i'm interested to hear from the audience now thank you uh yeah so i guess i just like to write uh read the questions we have um so the first one is from uh, Sophie, and this question is, post COVID-19, we are expecting tourists to have quite different demands from tourist destination, including higher standards or hygiene, social distancing, and a preference for outdoor and rural activities, rather than visiting cultural cities with crowds. So how do you think uh, the different destination in Central Asia will adapt to this? Well, maybe, uh, uh, Jonathan, do you want to try and, and have a go? Because you would come with your demands. How, how do you see that? I think I'm probably not the right person to answer this one, actually. So <laughs> should we spin on? <laughs> no, I'm, I'm, welcome, I'm welcome to go. Uh, well, Beruz, I think you probably then have to take I'm it. I'm thinking of Beruz, so please. Yeah, I'll take the heat. Yeah, I'll take the heat. <laughs> I think I mean, it's a very right question. And uh, uh, I think it's a question not only for Central Asian countries. I think it's a question to the ministry of the tourism around the world. Because the one thing you want to travel, one thing you want when you spend your money, X amount of money, when you want, you want at least certain type of guarantees that you know what, nothing will happen to you, you know, or at least a certain type of guarantees that it's gonna be fine. So I think I can give you an example of Uzbekistan. I am not sure in what context, but I'm willing to send. Maybe later on people can, can receive it once I receive it from the Ministry of the Tourism. Since I don't work there, I didn't have it on my hand. However, the Ministry of Tourism of Uzbekistan is working on something which is called, uh, uh, they want to have a certain type of uh, uh, say, uh, like a safe travel guarantee, meaning that uh, like they will, they they want to answer that question. They want to they want to make convince you that it's going to be safe to travel to Uzbekistan. They're doing it a promo. Uh, as soon as I receive, I'm going to say, send it to you. But I think it 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 it, it, it answers the questions of the Sophie that you no know, those things will be taken care of. Uh, like social distancing. If you're traveling with a uh, with a ride, it will be you know some sort of travel arrangement uh, uh, through your uh, airplane, taxi, your hotel. Uh, I think they are, they're taking care and making sure that uh, you will have the safety checks there. And as a ministry, they are focusing on, on this right now. So I think they're working on a safe travel guarantee. And uh, I think every country has to come up with own algorithm of how to assure that guarantee, how to make sure that you can uh, guarantee people uh, that you know they, they 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 can travel safely. So uh, sorry for to give you the, such a vague answer because I I don't have that guarantee what it is in there. So I can only do the wild guesses. At the same time, as soon as I receive, I'm happy to uh, to send it over. Maybe you know it will be useful for others. Yeah, Gareth, I saw you um, nodding in violent agreement. Uh, would you like to add uh, anything to that? I, I think once. As we move through this, I'm sure there will be vaccines. I'm sure there will be, um, whether it's COVID passports to say you've had it and you're not going to get it again or you're not going to pass it on. I'm sure in the sort of midterm, that's going to happen. Uh, in the short term, I just hope that we can move away from quarantines because I'm, I'm in quarantine at the moment. I've got a stamp on my hand. I've got 14 days here in my house. Um, 
because I did those two flights last week internally in, in India. But we actually, uh, you, you can't have tourism if people go and have to sit in a hotel for 14 days because you can't afford that. So you've got to get rid of that, but you can only do that if there are safety checks put in place. Um, I think we need to look at countries around the world that have actually managed to control COVID uh, in a better way than a lot of countries. Uh, and I'm not just thinking of New Zealand. I think they've done a brilliant job. But I'm thinking about places like Mongolia. That's, as far as I'm concerned, it's part of Central Asia. They have got fewer cases than most people. And all of their cases they have in Mongolia were imported cases. They've got no cases inside the country at all and haven't had. They locked down in January uh, and the only cases they've had are people coming into Mongolia, even though they're right on the Chinese border. Uh, and their tourism is opening, but it's domestic tourism. And so you've got a lot of, uh, a lot of expats, a lot of people working uh, internationally in Mongolia who can't leave, the country's still locked down. Uh, they can't leave, but what they're doing, they're opening their own tourism up to regenerate that so that when they open, it'll be up and running. And I think that's something that countries can do as they get COVID under control, they can look at their domestic tourism for actually restarting it. But it has to be done in a safe way. You're totally right. Uh, there's Because people won't do it. They won't trust it if they can't do it safely. Yeah. No, thank you. Jonathan, I'll give you a, a chance to come back if you want on any of those points, uh, <laughs> since I unfairly picked on you first. I think, I mean, to repeat what I said about transport, I think as soon as you're in the country, I think Central Asia allows you to, to have space. Things like... I think it was Beruz that mentioned the idea of, of traveling in jeeps and kind of a smaller group travel, which is even more authentic in terms of a caravan. Um, so I really do think it is a, just the, the transport aspect of it, that as soon as that is okay, um, then the destinations themselves will be, will be fine. Yeah, no, that's important. And I Nick, guess if I, if I may, I'm sorry, yes. uh, if I may uh, answer. And at the moment, I think all of us were talking in a, uh, in a, in a way that in a, from the today's right now's world with no variables. But there is one variable that is going to play very, like it, it's going to play an enormous role. So Oxford University right now in a third phase of clinical human trials or for vaccine COVID-19, Indian company, uh, is uh, uh, Serum University. They are mass producing the, and they're saying in the, end of, in the end of this year, they will have 500 million vaccines to be ready. So maybe as a part of the, not marketing trick, but if Minister of Tourism of Uzbekistan says, you know what, if you want to travel to Uzbekistan, in a, we can have vaccination for you as a, as a present. So your tour package includes the vaccination. I think it's quite interesting because the cost of the vaccine, I spoke to the Serum University, uh, Serum Institute, and I actually signed the NDA for Uzbekistan. We're gonna receive the first batch of 100,000 vaccines if it's going to work. So, and the cost something around uh, 40, 40 US dollars, it's not that expensive. So for people, I know that a certain type of people who don't like the idea of vaccination and etc. blah, 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 blah. But some people may like the idea and say, you know what, if you give me, sign me in. So I think it can be used as a, if this is a variable. So vaccine is a variable in this situation. Other than that, we see the world come back to normal. There are just two, it boils down to two ways. Either you're gonna get the vaccination, or herd immunity. There is no other way uh, because it's going to be quarantine and unless 60% of the whole world is getting that and uh, COVID-19 becomes like a seasonal flu, we're going to be having that Zoom talks and everything yeah. is going to be like that. So let, let, let me, sorry to interrupt. I, I guess, Sophie uh, Ibbotson, you, you asked the question. Um, you've heard some answers to it. Uh, is there anything you want to come back on? I don't know if we can get Sophie off mute. Uh, Can you yes. Hear? yes, I'm just interested whether the answers have, have answered your question or you saw it from a different angle. I, I think to a large extent, I mean, I think there are huge opportunities within Central Asia for social distanced activities, partly because the volume of tourists is not there, partly because there's just a huge space. Um, and earlier, Berries in particular was talking about the opportunities for national parks, for caves, for uh, ecotourism and so on and so forth. And I think that's true within Uzbekistan and certainly within uh, 
Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan as well. One thing I do think that as a region we need to look at very seriously, and this is actually less of a concern for Uzbekistan, but particularly for Tajikistan and Kyrgyzstan, is investing in improving quality in uh, accommodation, in sanitation and in restaurants, because people are going to be much, much more concerned about health and safety and hygiene when they're traveling because of the risk of contamination. Um, a lot of restaurants or cafes that you go to, particularly in uh, smaller places in Tajikistan, don't have hand washing facilities for their staff, uh, let alone for their customers. And people are going to be worried, particularly if they're um, traveling in places where the healthcare systems are um, not great as well. They are going to be much, much more concerned about being able to wash their hands, about being concerned that everybody else is washing their hands. So I think one thing that tourism departments need to do is actually be much more rigorous in setting guidelines for hygiene and safety, and then ensuring that there is uh, funding and capacity building available to help small businesses um, increase the quality of their services. We won't get ill when we uh, eat off the street <laughs> food anymore. Uh, that's, that's good to well, hear. That, that would be an ideal, ideal scenario. <laughs> <laughs> Lovely. Also, sorry. sorry. If, if, the destinations are going to attract higher spending tourists um, because there will be fewer, fewer budget tourists to go around. Um, if people are spending more money, they're going to expect higher standards and yeah. therefore we're going to have to meet their expectations. Yeah. yeah. Well, thanks, Sophie, thank you for the question. I, and just in the interest of time, I mean, we could go on debating this uh, for a long time, but maybe, Virginia, is there another question that, uh, that we, we could uh, turn our attention to? Thank you, Sophie, again. I think you're on mute. I don't know if <laughs> you know you're on mute. <laughs> or, or Marat, is there another question that? Uh... Uh, yes, I think we do have questions uh, from our interns. Um, Bajen or Sonia will help me out. Or, or maybe maybe I, I ask, someone is raising a hand. Maybe that's the old fashioned way. I'm Peter. sorry, anyone hear me? P I think yes. Peter raised his hand uh, first. <laughs> we have questions, uh, I can so, read yeah, them. Peter raised a hand, it's the old fashioned way, but I c can we get him off mute? <laughs> yes, one second, let me find him. <laughs> it's the control, it doesn't, doesn't, it works very well for the class, but. Uh... <laughs> Peter, you should okay. be. Uh online now? Yes, hello everybody, I'm Peter Lindsay and I'm a consultant to British Expertise and uh, chair the CACBIG Central Asia Forum. Many of you I see looking at the list of people here today. Uh, good to see you Sophie, good obviously to see you Nick and Marat. Uh, many of you have spoken or been to our events. We've had quite a few tourism related events and I'm sure we will be doing so. Um, my comment is just a little bit picking up on the comments Sophie Ibbotson just made, really good point about, um, you know, the countries needing to kind of obviously have in place safety measures for COVID-19 and perhaps have those almost independently verified to give more assurance to people. But one of the questions that's come up repeatedly at our British expertise events is about countries having emergency medical response. And this kind of goes beyond just the COVID debate, you know, that if you were hiking in the mountains of Uzbekistan and you suddenly had a appendicitis or something, you know, you'd probably die. Um, so what measures, I mean, this is not really a question, it's more just something for us all to reflect on. What measures are the individual countries taking to have in place some kind of emergency evacuation or medivac or air ambulance or something like that. I mean, obviously it will depend across the region, so let's not get bogged down on it. But I think behind the scenes and beyond COVID-19, this is something that the country should be, should be looking at generally. Peter, would you say that this is then a force for change, uh, and maybe the same with Sophie's one about, you know, people washing their hands, 
um, yeah. maybe the pandemic will be a force for real change in, in countries that will benefit beyond just the tourists coming there, but actually uh, for everybody, I would hope. Yeah, I mean, I think I think so. Yes, I think this could be this sort of change in mentality and culture and behaviour, um, which is being sort of forced on us, is something we should have been perhaps thinking about generally. But yeah, uh, yeah. anyway, I just wanted to flag that up. It's as, as interesting. I might just go back to the panel and if anyone on the panel would like to uh, perhaps make a comment back on that, because I think that's an interesting point. Oh, well, it's I'm, a I'm... No, go ahead. Yeah, hi Peter. Yeah, I think you made a very good point here. Absolutely, the safety is first, and I think uh, governments has to like uh, there are different roles and different ministries here and there. The, there is a room for cooperation. So I think in here, as we have a ministry of uh, uh, emergency situations, and there is there are definitely need to be like people trained in those national parks, for instance, to have at least a phone booths every five kilometer around the world or whenever they are going, they're given some communication stuff that they can communicate all the time. And in national parks, I've been visited in one, we were actually trying to prepare that the one where with the uh, Jurassic uh, era dinosaur footsteps, we actually kind of made a, quite a comprehensive uh, uh, master plan of creating the first like first aid emergency room uh, like a Jaeger, Jaeger, right? Jaeger that, that is going to go with him along and we will train him to show the first aid and everything. So we were actually thinking about that along the way uh, because like you, you made a very clear point. And I think with the opportunity comes the responsibility. Of course, if you address those things, I think more opportunity will emerge into like a profit. And once government sees an opportunity of potentially making, you know, hundreds and millions, they, they will be investing because we, everybody understands that in tourism, you invest and it's like a capital in, intensive at the first, but ROI is higher in a midterm or a long term. So uh, I think it's a very right point. Thank you. And, and Jonathan, I think you were also trying to make a point there as well. Um, just that I think this crisis has shown all countries the importance of, of healthcare and, and emergency aid. And I think that any tourism landscape in the next five, seven, ten years will have to have healthcare more at its centre. And I think that organisations will have to invest more in, in healthcare for their tourists. So I, I think this might be a positive change in the future, that this shock of, of COVID-19 might persuade um, you know, tour operators and government to actually invest more in, in all sorts of healthcare, not just COVID specific. Yeah, no, I, I'm, I'm, I like the positivity. So um, again, just to give a chance for more questions, um, we can either do it by raise of the hands or if uh, Sania or Virginia have a question. Yes, Sania, you, you had a question that you've... But I can't hear you, I'm afraid. <laughs> Me too. Maybe we'll solve all these technology niggles uh, by the end of this. Can you hear me? Yes. Sorry. Yes. Finally. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Um, I'm an editor assistant, and now I will help uh, to read the next question. Uh, so the next question is from uh, Maya Shunchilaeva. And her question is, what should we expect after five, seven years after COVID-19? In tourism sphere, your opinions. Is Maya is is, is Maya still online? Um, I'd just be interested to understand uh, where 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 the question was coming from. Is, is Maya online? Uh, yes, yeah, she she, um, uh, she was online, but she left ah, for okay. another we'll, conference. We'll take the question anyway. Uh, what mm -hmm. should we expect five seven years after COVID nineteen in the tourism sphere? So, um, uh, Gareth, why don't you? Start us off with uh, your thoughts. Uh, now we're thinking. Well, just, I, I can't mean, tell you what it's going to be like, but I can tell you what it's not going to be like. It's not going to be like anything we've seen before. We're not going to have the um, the mass tourism. We're not going to have the, uh, the, the the same sorts of things that we've had before. We we've, we've all got to actually adapt and change. And if we don't change, then uh, you know we, we don't we don't deserve to have actually gone through this and. If we haven't learned anything from it, we certainly don't deserve to have gone through it. Um, I, I think that in five years' time, I think places that people haven't discovered before are going to be the new places. I think people now, they don't want, um, 
material things. I think they want experiences, they want memories. Uh, and I think they're going to want to go somewhere different. And this is why it's an opportunity for Central Asia. Uh, it was interesting. I was, uh, I was actually reading last week one of these polls of the, the top 10 destinations for the next five years. And at the top of it was Ethiopia. Well, I would never have come up with that one. And third was Iran. I would never have come up with that one either. But these is, this is where people are thinking. They're thinking about going somewhere where they can have an experience. Uh, and from my own experience, you know, Central Asia definitely gives you that. Um, okay, I think some people are going to want to be independent. They're going to want to do it on their own. Um, but at the same time, a lot of people are going to want to have their hands held, not literally, not in these days, no, no touching. So I think they don't need to be guided through it. And I think that's where you've got to be ready and flexible for that. Um, whatever the tourist um, experience will be, as I say, it won't be the, uh, the cheap budget holidays. It won't be cheap budget flights. People will have to plan their trips. They will have to put time and effort and money into getting the experience they want. And I think it's the experience rather than the actual material thing uh, that people are going to be aiming at. So I think they will be, they will have spare money because I don't think they'll be buying the stuff uh, at home. They've realized they don't need it. People sat at home the last, you know, two or three months have realized they don't need all the stuff they've got and they're getting rid of it. So I think they will spend the money on the experience rather than buying stuff. That's my prediction. Thank you. If I could add to that, we spoke earlier about um, thinking that maybe the days of cross many border trips might be over. So perhaps in five or 10 years time, we might start to think about the region less in terms of the stands or the Silk Route. And actually the separate countries might form more of a brand in their own right. Yeah. So you wouldn't think of traveling along the Silk Route. Um, you might actually by then know more about what Kazakhstan offers, what Uzbekistan offers, and not think of them as much as kind of one entity but actually as individual places that you can easily spend a fortnight just exploring Uzbekistan or just exploring one part of Uzbekistan and not feel that you have to sort of follow in Marco Polo's footsteps or do some epic multi-country trip. If you are restricted to kind of, you know, covered realities, then maybe the country's marketing departments can work on a way to develop their own brands. So actually just spending a fortnight in Tajikistan or just Kyrgyzstan would be would be enough and people in the west would be more aware of the differences between different countries so they wouldn't yeah, just is nodding and, and writing his new marketing campaign right? <laughs> <laughs> Baruch, did you want to uh, yeah. yeah yeah absolutely I, I i agree with my colleagues but i disagree with some of some of the remarks they make i think we're inheritably uh, as a human being, as our virtue and nature, we, we learn very hard ways and uh, people tend to forget about things like quite soon. So once it's over, once we find vaccine or herd immunity or it just, you know, it just magically disappears like it, the SARS did, we're going to be, you know, it is hard to teach old dog new tricks. Like people going to be traveling like they will be traveling. However, the whole industry is going to change. The traveling itself is going to change. Probably this is my message to people who are working in the tourism sphere and who are in a touristic agencies. I think the rise of digitalization, I think that being mobile natives, being uh, like mobile, like nomads, like teaching us a lot that we actually don't need a middleman, right? I have, I have Uber, I have Skyscanner, I have uh, Airbnb, uh, there, are, there are some couch surfing, there are a lot of things I can bespoke my traveling myself. So I think there will be a very big loss for travel companies who work in a traditional way. I think it's, it's for them, it's a very big wake up call. Although we were going to the, to, toward that fourth industrial revolution where any jobs are being replaced with a software app and everything. So I think the tourism sphere is going to be affected dramatically. So it's a really right time for travel companies to tour agencies to go digital, to, to diversify and to pivot. Other than that, uh, it's, it's gonna be like, a, you know, it's, they're, gonna, they're gonna disappear. But in general, I, I, I cannot agree more with my colleagues saying that people will go to places they've never been. People are going to, uh, so traveling was to see, right? To go to Paris, 
take a photo right now. It's a, to go to Paris and have a cooking classes. So you want to do something. So it becomes from to see, it becomes to do. So whoever grasped that idea and becomes a, a tourism around to do, around the, uh, the experience, they're going to win. And Uzbekistan is going to win. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. What I might just do is, um, if there's anyone who on the audience who wants to make a comment or ask another question, just raise your hand. Um, that might be a good time to uh, to see if anyone would like to add anything. Just sort of raise your hand, and uh, Sania or Virginia will. Uh, we have some more questions. I think two questions. Yeah. But I just I think um, uh, Nuridin had his hand up, so maybe I can just ask uh, if he can be unmuted. No, still on mute. Are you able, uh, Virginia, are you able to un unmute Nuruddin's? Ah, perfect. Hi, hi, all. hi. Uh, my name is Nuruddin. I worked for um, big hotel brands, including Shangri-La, Corinthia, Qatar Hospitality Group. And I'm always interested and fascinated about the um, future <clears throat> and tourism industry of Uzbekistan. And I, I uh, would like to take this opportunity to uh, thank Behruz for the tremendous work they are doing and the government under our uh, uh, President, His Excellency, Mr. Merzioyev. Um, we shouldn't forget that the country is, is uh, been open for the past two, three years and they have done massive work. They have done a massive work. Yes, we had uh, uh, tourists always, but at this scale, it's only been past two years. And another uh, um, massive sort of uh, 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 the, the drive, the engine that drives all this uh, tourism is the uh, vloggers, bloggers, or whatever they're called. Um, they go, they uh, uh, let the world know what it is and how it is, it is like in those countries. Um, say, for instance, we, as, as uh, um, honourable uh, ladies and gentlemen uh, mentioned that um, we are, uh, I, I believe Gareth uh, mentioned that, that uh, the, the next uh, uh, destination, popular destination will be Iran. Why? Because we are, we have, we've been to Spain, we've been to Paris, we've been to the, the, the France, we've been to Italy, we know it. Now we need something new. We want to see those that are unknown, that are new to us. And these bloggers and vloggers, they're doing a fantastic job by showing how it is like. And I, I would like to say that I hope, as an Uzbekistan, because I'm from Bukhara, I grew up in the, the place called Chormino. Um, the, I, I hope and I believe that Uzbekistan will keep its traditions and, and culture and, and uh, the things they used to uh, do years back because that's what people want to see that we will not lose that we will not get mixed into this globalization and then we will lose our identity and when you go to Tashkent it's, it's just another big city uh, uh, like uh, I don't know London uh, and Paris and all you see is just the monuments that were built uh, 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 centuries ago and there is no, nothing else to see. But I, I would love to go, when I go to Uzbekistan, I want to see Uzbekistan. I want to feel Uzbekistan. I want to taste Uzbekistan. And uh, this, uh, but again, you know, there's plenty plenty more to do um, uh, for, for Behruz and for the government of uh, Uzbekistan. And they're doing it. They are doing it. I, and I, I thank them for that. Uh, because as, as correctly Sophie mentioned, the um, uh, uh, the medical side of the the the, the uh, health health and safety issues that we have, you know, there, there's nothing to 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 hide. Uh, we do have, but then we need to work towards improving those to create more favorable infrastructure for the tourists uh, that are coming and seeing. So they they are uh, 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 their visit their uh, experience is flawless. Moving from one city to another without any troubles without uh, where to exchange money where can i get the cash out where can i eat where can i rent a car where can i sleep can i call home uh, you know all of those things and 
not being not being um, sort of like uh, troubled or or worried. Uh, what if something happens? What if I get bitten by whatever mosquito and it gives uh, the, the the reaction, allergic reaction? What if if I have a uh, food poisoning? It's, you know, if all of those, uh, uh, if we get the answers to all of those questions, I think Uzbekistan is a fantastic destination to, mm -hmm. to go and visit and, and, and explore. As the food correctly mentioned, not only Samarkand and Bukhara, but go go and explore deeper those the unknown and thank, see. Thank, thank you Nuridin. I have to I have to I just be conscious of the time but uh, oh. and I think the comments you say about Uzbekistan probably reflected about the rest of the countries. Um, I, I'm conscious of a time I think we probably have time for one more question um, either from Sania or if anyone has a question to put their hand up or uh, I think uh, Raza. Yeah, yeah we do have a question from uh, Raza, Raza uh, was from Pakistan. Yeah Raza, actually Hi, everybody. I'm Reza from Pakistan at the moment. I'm just stuck due to the flights. I'm waiting the resuming of the flights to UK and I'll be back. I just, I have one question. In, in July or August, I'm thinking to visit Central Asian's country. I have just one concern about the health issue and uh, security issues as well. I mean, due to the COVID-19, everybody's worried about this disease. So, uh, is there any initiative from the hotel industry, either they are reducing their rents or something else in food and renting a car or something like that? So, if we will have such kind of initiative might be, we'll be able to revive the tourism industry in these countries. This is my question. It's a very good question. Um, I, I, we've lost uh, Leroux, I think, as well, which uh, and he might have been perfect to answer. But G Gareth or Jonathan, uh, any any thoughts on that about the sort of uh, the way in which uh, we we need uh, the countries to, I guess, improve the sanitization and um, their health and safety approach. I guess it's linked. I've I think, read to I've read little bits and pieces from tour operators about how they are dealing with the kind of the, the first stage of reopening their businesses. Um, and it really is incredible detail, the kind of you know, disinfecting tour buses and temperature checks before boarding the bus every morning and things like that. So I'm, I'm very sure that even now in all countries of Central Asia, there will be steps in place to keep you safe. Um, but I can't be specific. Also. I'm sure Bechus would be better place than I am, but I'm, I'm sure from what I've read and what I've researched that mm. if I were to get on a, a tour bus, for example, in any Central Asian country tomorrow, I would feel completely safe. I, I, I would think that the, the people running it would be completely in, in control. If I, if I come, back to the, come back to the original question as well. I think there was uh, I think there about cost and reducing prices and all of those things. I, I have to say, um, from what I'm hearing, I'm not seeing that. I think that other countries, certainly they are reducing costs. Um, I, I've been researching because I'm coming back to Europe before going to Uzbekistan, but the, 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 there are some, some costs that are coming down. People are offering extra nights in hotels, that sort of thing, for those that are open. At the moment, I don't think they know. Um, I think once the borders open, I think then the costs and the pricing structure will change. Um, we were saying earlier that some of the places in, in Uzbekistan would love to have you staying there and so therefore will, you know, I'm sure, do, do what they can to actually reduce costs. I think there's room for negotiation, I think there's room for bargaining, but at the moment, because things aren't open enough, I think that those, those things aren't in place. And things like car hire, for example, uh, I was actually looking at car hire this morning and, you know, they seem to be the same price they were four or five months ago. They haven't gone up, but they certainly haven't gone down. So. Um, I think it's watch this face when it comes to that sort of thing. I, I, I agree with you, Jonathan, though. I think that, you know, people are taking this seriously uh, and a lot of tour companies and, uh, and people offering transport, for example. Um, for, for example, we use a lot of Ubers here and they're being disinfected all the time and, uh, and it's actually being, you know, it is being sorted out and looked after. And coming back to what Sophie was saying earlier, I, I'm actually quite confident that people will change their, their, their behavior and change their, 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 their medical standards and their, their health standards. Uh, I hope again, if we learn nothing from this thing, then 
yeah, wash your hands more. Yeah. <laughs> and that, that's a very nice way to end uh, uh, because uh, we literally uh, run out of time. So I think it just leaves me uh, to say thank you very much to, uh, well, Gareth and Jonathan who's still with us and Ber Beruz and Rafis who temporarily uh, left us. Uh, been a fantastic discussion. I, I suspect we could go on all afternoon and um, uh, it's actually been very nice to be able to see people um, yeah. uh, on the screen. Uh, I you know, met, met people, as it were, that I have known your names, uh, but I've never seen you. So uh, hopefully we can see each other again in person uh, somewhere in the world, preferably oh, in Central I... Asia. Um, hopefully without too much quarantine and too many checks, and hopefully we'll be uh, with better sanitization uh, and be able to enjoy the things we did, maybe in a slightly different and better way than, than before. But it just leads me to thank our panelists very much for, uh, for their time, for their input and their insights and preparation for this. Thank you in the audience uh, for joining and spending an hour and a half of your time uh, listening to and participating. Uh, and uh, Bajenia and Sanya, thank you for setting this up, uh, Marat as well, uh, and to the Eurasian Creative Guild who uh, continue obviously to support Open Central Asia magazine and we'll do our best at least to report on, uh, on some of what's been going on and discussed today and um, the future of tourism in Central Asia, which by the accounts of this audience is uh, far from dead. So uh, thank you very much. I don't know, Marat, if you had any closing words you want to yes. discuss, that's it from me. Yes, I would like to do it. First of all, I would like to, say, to thank everyone who joined us today. We had up to 40 people um, uh, being with us online at the same time. And I just made a, 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 some stats. So we've got 11 countries, UK, India, Russia, Belarus, USA, Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, France, Kyrgyzstan, Pakistan, and Greece joining us today. It just shows the power of the Zoom. So we can see it in 11 different countries and see each other and hear each other and discuss and raise issues. So this is our first uh, Zoom meeting for Open Central Asia magazine. Uh, we plan to do it every month. So if anyone would like to initiate a topic on discussion, we're happy to uh, look into your ideas. And probably in a month's time, we'll have a new meeting. Please join us. We also do have uh, our ECG Zoom meetings every Wednesday at uh, 2 p.m. at Moscow times, three of them in Russian and one of them in English. So the next one in English will be dedicated to communication in cities, uh, will be led by Natalie Bates from London tomorrow, 2 p.m. at uh, Moscow time or noon at UK time. So please join us tomorrow. Uh, which will not be on tourism, but will be on culture co communication. It will be in English. And in, in a month's time, we hope to continue the new tradition of OCA Zoom meetings and have another uh, topic because OCA magazine covers everything, society, culture, tourism, business, politics, and we're open to any suggestions. So uh, once again, we'd like to thank our panelists and uh, Sanya and Bajena to helping to set up this uh, event and uh, looking forward to see you soon again. Thank you very Bye much. Thank you Thank very you much. Thank you all. Yeah. Bye-bye.